Okay, hi everyone. We're going to get started here in just a second. So I'm incredibly excited to welcome Dr. Carl Bettiger to the CPB seminar today. Um, Carl is a former population biology uh, graduate student who did really great work with Alan Hastings and others here in the department. Uh, he's a co-founder of the R Open Science Project and now works as a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, just 40 minutes away from us. And Carl does lots of really cool work in ecological forecasting, machine learning, uh, geospatial things, a little bit of everything that's super cool. So I'm really excited to welcome Carl to speak today. I'll let him take it away. Thank you. It's great to be back. Well, we'll talk today. Will algorithms save our climate? And uh, will we regret it when they do? This is going to be a somewhat kind of sweeping talk to kind of go back to questions that I really struggled with under my PhD and uh, trying to kind of channel the kind of ways of thinking that I learned in CPB and uh, kind of like shaped my uh, own career going forward. Um, so let's begin. So we know ecosystems are complex and uncertain. And uh, we know that we're in a pretty bad situation with our planet. I don't need to retell that story. We know that just measuring and kind of watching it go down is not enough, right? We want to do more. Well, we have the answer already and it's wrong. As you heard, I've worked a lot on forecasting. And so a lot of the time we say that the purpose of our science is to build better models. Eventually our models will be this kind of crystal ball. You'll be able to look at them and tell what's going to happen in the future. And if only we can give the decision makers good, accurate, and timely predictions, they will make better decisions and maybe the planet won't go down the tube so fast. I'm going to argue why that's. So first off, getting a forecast to actually work is hard. We're not very good at our job. Whereas, you know, ecology is complex. In fact, theoretical ecology has spent pretty much the entirety of the last century just showing us all of the amazing different ways we can be wrong about everything, all the complex things it can do. You know, we can do cycles, we can do tipping points, we can do chaos. Math can basically just kind of create any dynamics you want to see. And, and not just one way, but like in four or five different ways at least. And uh, the data we have is just often not enough to tell us like so which one's which. There's just too many possibilities, too much complexity. First off, these are not a forecast and that's often what we do. We say, let's look at some data and let's reproduce the phenomenon we see. That's not predicting, that's just describing in math things that we already see. And we can do that in different ways. Okay, then we say like, well, the model fits the data. This is how we know that the model is doing well, right? We get a chart kind of like this and we're like, look, my data points are stars and they're all within the data. Surely this means my model is correct. Or at least my model is valid or, or good. No. Okay, sometimes we can say a relative statement. Look, my model fits the data better than your model. Maybe my model isn't right, but it's better than your model. Can we say this? Is this right? Do we now have at least we can, you know, compare in relative terms? No, no, why, why do I say that? Well, it depends what we mean by better. And I'll try to put a bit more flesh on why we are modeling. It's just something Alan would always ask us, you know, Models can try to do different things. You're not just trying to create like if maps were trying or models. You wouldn't just try to recreate the entire world a map and have everything in it. That would just be the world. There would be no good to anybody. Like you're supposed to leave things out. We can try more than that single comparison though. We can try to say at least if we're going to do forecasts, let's not like pick one model and say my model's better than that one other model and therefore like publish my paper and I'm right. Let's compare against lots of models. Okay, this is a little bit better. We can at least say we're better than like what lots of people are doing. And we've tried to encourage this practice in real time and with actual forecasts, meaning predicting data before you look at it. Something surprising that we don't do very often uh, with this group called the Ecological Forecasting Initiative. It's a grassroots group that's been running for the past couple of years. And this is just a sweeping overview of the forecast challenges that we've built around places where we have data that's reliably collected in the exact same way for a long period of time, such as NEON. And so this is several different challenges we've built in different themes, phenology, aquatics, terrestrial aquatics, beetles, as well as weather, that you try to make predictions that are being measured and see how well you're doing. And we've been quite successful at making this easy enough to onboard teams, often students, submitting all their different models. And this just shows like when the model starts showing up in there. And all the models are showing up in a nice little catalog. We have lots of details about them. This is better, right? So join, submit a forecast, see if you're better than everybody else. 
It's surprisingly hard to beat some very simple models, surprisingly easy to beat some very old serious professors with complicated models. It's better, okay? But it's not enough, right? These aren't decisions. Decisions require something more. We have a complicated environment and we need to talk about what actual actions we're making and what the consequences of those actions are. In the words of decision theory, something I learned after kind of despairing at my models are not enough at regime shift work, Alan introduced me at the very, very end of my PhD to Jim Sankirko here and, oh, there's a math for doing decisions. Mind blown. We need to write down the space of possible actions. At the end of the day, we're not trying to choose which model we need. If we're trying to make decisions, we're saying these are the possible actions I can take as a decision maker. The decision maker doesn't want to know if your Bayesian hierarchical model is better than someone else's. They don't know what to do. We need an action space and we're trying to maximize an objective. That's a real world objective. They care about dollars. They care about conservation value. They care about species on the ground. It's not goodness of fit. That's not the objective. The objective is like, what are the actual purpose of this? Okay, how does that change things? It changes the way we use the models. In fact, we go and talk to the decision makers, they'll we kind of known this all along. In fact, the primary version of models was never about forecasts. The primary value of ecosystem models is your heuristic tool for communicating, for developing scenarios, for expressing uncertainties. The liable forecast will always remain elusive. From Schindler and Hellborn wrote this in 2015, but you can find earlier references going back to 1994 in the uh, scientific literature, more on the earth sciences side, the uh, Oreskes and colleagues have pointed out, you know, this we, we talk about validating our models. That it's, there's no such thing in the real world in open systems. There's nothing that ever says this model is valid, right? It's good for a particular purpose. It's bad for other purposes. There's no one valid unique model because there are many models that can serve that purpose. The value of models is always open to question. It's primarily heuristic. In fact, I found an even older reference going all the way back to the third age of Middle Earth telling us that even the wisest cannot tell the future. The model shows many things, things that work, things that are, and some things that are yet to pass. Okay, so let's try to put this in practice in a fisheries context. So simple models, Alan, tell us to start with simple models and understand what's going on there. I've got three different possible models that might describe the growth of a fishery. Let's try to do some management with these different models. Let's begin by seeing how well they predict the future. How will they predict data? So this is what that earlier figure was. Model two was the red curve, and it is definitely fitting the data much better than model one. So therefore, should I make my management decisions using model two? Seems to be a better description of the underlying process. But if I look at what happens when I manage under model two, and I manage under model one, well, the ecology is different. They tell me different amounts of harvest. I harvest more, and I find in that model, I, the population just doesn't want to get very big. And then if I manage with that ridiculously fitting model one, well, the population of the fish stock recovers quite nicely. But weirdly, it is not just in the ecology. The economy is economic value. I'm actually getting more fish from this blue curve. I'm overfishing this red curve in this empirical sense of overfishing. I'm keeping the population size so small, it's not very productive. Why? Why? Why is that model that fit better doing so worse? Where did these decisions come from? It came from the perfect theory, from exactly what Jim told us to do. Stick this into a dynamic program. The, the math model gives a transition matrix. The matrix goes into an algorithm. The algorithm spits out a policy. It's an equation, a one-step rate forecast determines a policy. We obey the policy, we get bad results. What went wrong? It's easy to see in retrospect. You know, these are the possible models. Well, we remember in analytic theory, Optimal harvest is to harvest at the maximum growth rate. The true model in this case happens to be the green curve. When we were choosing between the blue and red, we remember our basic theory that says go to the max of that function. The blue max is just about coincidentally over the max of that green curve. It's the right max. It's wrong about everything else, but it's right about where the maximum occurs. So if I fish to there, even though I'm making terrible predictions, I've got the one thing that the model needed to tell me, which is right, like where was the location of that peak? Everything else, that wasn't what the model was for. The red curve is really close to the green curve and therefore it makes predictions that look more closely, right? That's always gonna fit better. And whatever your goodness of fit metrics are, the red curve will always fit better because it's closer in every space to the green curve. But that was not the purpose of the decision, right? The decision says, what's the population size I wanna harvest to? And this says, let's well, harvest to this, wherever the peak of the red is. If I believe in the red, 
Whoever the people in blue is, if I believe in the blue and the green. Okay. Is this just a contrived example? Of course, right? These are two symbols. And I get away from this with more complicated models. That's what we'll look at next. But these models are heuristic tools, right? They express uncertainties. We could have lots of these models to express our uncertainties for where that peak was. And if we were lucky, we would have one that would be flexible enough to kind of be both, right? To be the green curve, if we're creative enough. But the real world's complex. Okay. We get more data. We just solve the problem with more data, better inform our models. Maybe this was just sort of two dimensionally poor. We spent quite a bit of time sort of looking at our best opportunities for more data. After all, the age of big data, aren't we? So one of our largest collections of data is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility taking all occurrence data from all of our available records, uh, over 2 billion records by now that has been assembled over time from museums, from scientific papers, and increasingly from citizen science sources like eBird and iNaturalist. If you put that data up, uh, you kind of say, where, what's the overall story that it's telling us? From every single species we know about on the planet, you know, there are, uh, we discover it can tell us the most about the one species, the one species that's not in that data. Us, right? Then this data are us. This uh, is a paper led by one of my PhD students that came out recently, a perspective piece, just telling this narrative of just what is the challenge with monitoring and making decisions using these new sort of emerging big data frameworks. When you look at this data, you see where our cities are, where our roads are. You see where our English speaking people are. You see where our wealth is. You don't see where our biodiversity is. That map is not a map of the biodiversity, right? You can see stories of our wars. You can see here during the Cambodian War, during the Civil War, right? The, the records vanish. If we don't have the context, the social context in mind, and you just see, here's, here's counts, right? Well, something happened to the biodiversity. But the changes in the data are almost never about the biodiversity. It's almost always about us. So there's a lot to correct for. And these are not obviously easy things sometimes that you would necessarily be able to say, oh, I just reweighted by the source of the observations or by the number of counts, or like you'd kind of need to know a social context that this is unfolding on to picture these big changes. In fact, you can reconstruct the racist redlining practices of the 1930s from where number of bird observations per hectare is today, right? Where, where is this coming from? Well, it seems like you see, if you look at the cubic occurrences, you can see a much higher density, almost double the density for instance, in Los Angeles, across many of the US cities that were redlined uh, by these racist housing uh, policies of the FDR administration during the Great Depression, which are implemented to stimulate the economy, but were said, oh, we can't give this money out to places that are predominantly black. We can't give this money out to places that are predominantly immigrant. And you can read their justification. It's explicitly racist. That was outlawed in the 1960s, but the legacy lives on, and it lives on in our biodiversity data. We can read it right out of it. In fact, is the problem getting better? It's getting worse, right? The, the curves are diverging. There's this sort of theme that we hope that as we democratize and get all this data, that we put more things on a level playing field. But the, the growth of data in high income areas is expanding faster, exponentially faster than else. So these problems are not only there, but they're getting worse, right? And so we have great challenges in kind of untangling all of these bits and pieces. And there's no easy solutions. We'll return to how what hard solutions look like uh, in the end. So our ultimate challenge is we have very imperfect data for all kinds of reasons, and we have imperfect models. We never know exactly which models are right. We have kind of possible candidate models. We know they capture kind of the spirit of what might be going on, but not all the details, and we don't know which one's right. How do we make decisions? This is a chicken. Uh, this chicken makes decisions. Uh, this chicken can be controlled as to the decisions it learns uh, by giving it a reward. I want it to pick pink dots and it doesn't have a model for the way that we're moving the dots. It just kind of learns from the reward, right? This, this is a process, this kind of learning. It's very different from like our normal theory we teach of like how to code a model, but it's a, it's a way of learning a model and we call this uh, reinforcement learning. All right, so chicken go away. Let's go to the next slide. We 
call this process reinforcement learning in the computer science literature. We'll have another name for it in just a moment. The idea is that the agent, the chicken, or maybe the artificial intelligence, can take an action on the environment. And two things happen from that action. It gets another observation of what the environment looks like, and it gets a reward. And maybe this reward happens only at the end of many of these cycles. Maybe this reward is in fact a penalty or a negative thing. It doesn't really matter the details. This is just like a very generic way of interacting with the environment and getting some feedback. It may not be observing everything about the environment. Often it can only see certain things. The internal states of that system may be invisible to the agent. This method has been popular in recent years. Uh, it's been developed from very primitive algorithms to now things that can beat computers and beat humans in chess and go uh, that can make beat humans in driving Formula One cars in controlling uh, nuclear uh, fusion reactions uh, and in playing computer games like Atari and uh, Starcraft. Uh, weirdly, it's also used uh, at the training part of going from like a language model like GPT into a chatbot like ChatGPT. There's a process of reinforcement learning that's done with humans in a loop called reinforcement learning with human feedback. We try to teach the algorithm not to say things that you don't want it to say that are either um, dangerous in some way or uh, that give behavior that is not acceptable for the algorithm to have. And so you can change this behavior. They also use RL for that. So it's widely used, richly developed algorithm. You don't see it a lot in ecology. But this process is very familiar to us, right? For, for decades now, we've already called this process adaptive management, except we don't tend to think about it with a computer agent. We think about it with real world agents. So I'm showing Glen Canyon Dam, one of the most famous case studies of adaptive management from Carl Walters uh, work and many others looking at like, it's a complex system. How do you time the releases of this big dam uh, in a way that solves a highly multi-dimensional objective problem so there's a little chub fish that you want to survive. If you give them this really cold water from the bottom of the dam, that's bad. If you pulse the dam, you can help build up the banks that uh, give it habitat refugia. If you just continually flow the dam, you can have warmer water, but you don't get like the nice refugia structure. <laughs> and then there's uh, indigenous rights control over the area that's in question. This is, of course, the Colorado River, one of the most contentious water sources in the country. You know, people depend on that water for many things, there's recreational fishers, there's many different objectives. You have some big control of it, right? We do this in many different cases, complex decision-making problems, right? Uh, we try, we see how we're doing, and we evaluate and change the policy. We experiment. That was the basic idea of adaptive management. It's written to law in several places now and several systems. Uh, in fact, many of the things that have been learned in RL and are now the cutting edge of computer science, uh, this fun little paper was done by two of my students. Uh, you can't see Lily being cut off there, is at Harvard in computer science, and Lily is on the left at Berkeley with me, uh, looking at the parallels in the literature. And we keep kind of rediscovering the same problems. That, uh, interestingly, the examples from ecology are often much older. We were there first. We have the same big challenges. We don't think you can read all of that, but we're dealing with uncertainty. We're dealing with, you have high stakes settings, uh, limited opportunities for interaction, complex environments, non-stationary environments, long-term planning. All of the things we're familiar with are also there cutting edge problems. So we can learn from each other. If we compare some of our methods, we face some similar challenges, we might get somewhere. We've been trying to do that. We've been saying, can we take some of these approaches and it gives us a way forward that we don't have when we're just trying to do a forecast alone. We can say, we don't know the exact model, but we have several different candidate processes. When we've done that in classical uh, methods, you're told the model's gotta be damn simple or we can't do any math on it. And that's where I lived for a long time until we got into these methods. And now you can add complexity almost for free to the model because the model is just a computer game. You know, it says I can simulate age structure. I can simulate stochasticity. I can simulate uh, spatial heterogeneity. Anything you want to put in there, you just kind of put into this computer. And if you have six different ways, it could work. And each of those have like a million different parameters. You can just kind of draw big simulation space. This is what the RL loves. It says, good, I will now try to learn not the best solution, Promises of best solution have gone out the window. We are now in a world of heuristic solutions. It says, I'm just going to try to play chess better than you. Can I make better decisions than you on a realistic problem? So let's see how this works. Let's take some of our toy problems first, where we know the right answer, because we can do the math on paper, and we know this is the best of all solutions. Can RL find that? And then can we make the model more complex and see what happens? Or try it on different models where it doesn't know what the underlying process is at all, and it just has to learn and guess. 
So that's where we're going to try. Our first example is to do this in a setting that has tipping points. This is a challenge in fisheries management because you start harvesting, but you go a bit too far. In adaptive management, you go a bit too far. All of a sudden, you have learned that there's a tipping point there, but at great cost to you. And it can be very expensive to get back. So we built a system with three species that has a tipping point. We knew some ways that we would manage this kind of classically uh, is to say, let's do, uh, you know, simulate a bunch of processes and try to figure out the one escapement or the one mortality rule that you can apply to this. If you just fish at this value each year, what's kind of the safe value to get the maximum sustainable yield? But of course, the real world isn't static like that. There's no reason that you have to do exactly the same policy year after year. You can try like pulse strategies or complex space strategies. So how does this play out? So here we show the search of the kind of classic solution. You're saying, what's the one mortality to do? The best thing to do that gives you the maximum yield is right here is sort of the peak of this reward curve if you just simulate the process a lot. But you pay a high price for that. Sometimes this gives you great outcomes and sometimes terrible outcomes. The classic solution is to say, don't actually do MSY. Like you should fish with a little bit of caution. Just find out where the max is and take a little bit less than that. And that's probably pretty good. It's not too bad, it is pretty good. That's what's gonna be the solution in this sort of purple line. We're gonna compare that to the RL solution, which you know with interacting species, we remember from our basic classes, again with Alan, that a couple system like this can oscillate and we can get solutions that end up oscillating. So here's that like go to the edge solution. And sometimes it's fine until you push it too far and it crashes. 80% rule is pretty good, right? In this particular, existence of the simulation, it doesn't crash. Rarely does it go over the edge. But it also doesn't yield a lot of economic value because you're just trying to play it safe all the time. The dynamic reinforcement learning model comes up with a policy that's much more dynamic in management. The system is kind of allowed to do its natural oscillations and we have an oscillating yield curve and uh, we can get a much higher reward as a result. But this was still a simple model. We kind of knew what the optimal solution behavior should be. And so we're now trying things that are more and more Try to get some examples of this. So here, this is first, can we take kind of that same system uh, mathematically, but in a very different context, right? We're no longer trying to harvest, we're trying to build up a species. And this is in collaboration with some colleagues, Sally Otto and Nikki Love at uh, UBC, uh, my postdoc Felipe, uh, you see in the lower left corner there. So more or less, this is actually very similar to the dynamics in that three species fishing system. Uh, different set of parameters also oscillates but your goal is very different. You want to increase the population of the caribou that happens to compete with the moose and uh, is predated on by the wolves. But you don't want to like knock out the wolves entirely. Um, and this is going to first pass. You would want to make this richer by making this spatially structured and just about anything else you can imagine in complexity. But this is still tractable. We can still compare this to like what is the sort of standard solution for calling that's being proposed now which is not surprisingly a fixed effort strategy. So can we do better than a fixed effort strategy? This is actually a really hard one to get, even not to go crazy with a fixed effort strategy, not to lose one of the species entirely. And so the RL is quite good at finding the sort of fine-tuned responses uh, that allow, in this case, uh, the system to recover. Here I drive it with a changing climate as well, so it's a non-stationary system. And uh, initially this moves plot, uh, the, the moose's population is in green. We want to keep low and we're trying to get the caribou back, and they start going way down. As it gathers steam, it's able to bring this population back up to its targets. Uh, more recently, uh, in unpublished work that we have now started to do with Carl Walters, uh, who I mentioned earlier, and one of his students, uh, Chris Cahill, uh, in an age structured fishery, we can add more complexity in. And we're trying to focus now on a partially observed system. So don't allow the algorithm to know everything that's going on under them. So there are about 20 age classes in this fisheries model that's widely used in these uh, lakes in Michigan. And there's different observation process. They go out and do nets when they catch for measuring the scientific surveys, but the actual like harvest is mostly sport fishing with lines. So, so there's lots of little real world complexity in the model. And there's this kind of management is based on sort of a one dimensional intuition, same as those earlier examples that says there should be some constant MSY that we can harvest at, and we should just be able to apply that all the time. 
So if you think about an aid-structured model, it goes in these pulses. You get a good year, you get lots of little recruits. So the total biomass or the total population size could be very large. And if that's all you observe, you're like, oh, I should fish it now. But if you think like, as the manager does, like this is the first year I've seen that pulse, the manager almost always knows, no, don't trust the theory, wait. Wait till you see it two or three years in a row, it's gonna be moving up the age classes and you can should get it when it's a bit larger. You don't wanna harvest all little guys. We can, just by not giving it the full age structure, but by allowing it to see the RL to observe both the mean and the total abundance, it can do much, much better than the classic theory. When it just has the same information as the classic theory, it does exactly the same. It's getting the same rewards. And you can kind of see that here. So sorry, in their results, the graphs kind of suck. But uh, these three cases, I'll walk through what is going on. So this is where it's observing. The RL gets to observe two summary statistics, the total biomass and the mean biomass. And so when you can think the total number, there's a large number of individuals, but the mean weight is kind of small, you think there's a lot of little guys, don't harvest. And that's what's going on here in this low curve that says that the overall weight is low and it says don't harvest, right? And if the overall weight is super high, it's like, you should take these now before they're all lost. That's the green curve, it's very aggressive. And in between, it gives a medium answer in purple. You can see PPO, the reinforcement learning algorithm, in fact, the same algorithm that was used by the chat GPT team, is doing kind of a similar shape, but it's just forced to apply that same rule for every abundance, regardless of the mean weight. It doesn't know the mean weight. It's just observing the total abundance. It doesn't know there's there be a big, heavy fish or little tiny fish. And so it says this kind of compromised thing, which is as good as it can do. It's a very different strategy than what MSY does. It says, like, just do this all the time. But it's the same at some parts, the same here, it's kind of the same there. And it ends up giving you overall much the same utility. When things are in this kind of low dimensional space, we can kind of pull back the curtain on the black box and see what's under the hood, uh, which is nice. We get some intuition for the way the algorithm is behaving. It's not always like, this is just an uncomprehensible black box. As this two dimensional space becomes a 10 dimensional space, that can be kind of harder to interrogate, but it's often like a quip that RRL and AI algorithms are, are, are completely a black box and we can't understand they're doing, often we can. Uh, one more example from a student uh, that's now working with the consults here and others is with invasive green crab and a similar problem. Uh, this is an invasive species. So we've kind of tried to harvest something but make it a renewable resource. We've tried to protect something and increase its numbers. And now this is the opposite. There's species is taking over as an invasive and they're trying to decide sort of when to give up and when not to. And there's an integral projection model that describes the sort of growth of this group. And it's much too complex for us to do anything with classic decision theory, but it's relatively easy to put into the RL framework and we'll see what the RL algorithm works. And so, well, Abby has sort of been able to prove this uh, the simplest case in the stochastic dynamic programming and say when you should give up and when you shouldn't give up. Now we're trying to do this in RL. One of the aspects of this is to not solve just one model, but to see this as kind of a partitioning of the problem. We over here as ecologists can kind of build many different models of how we think the world is working. And we can go and bug our colleagues over in computer science that think they're gonna save the world and say, can you give us different agents that can learn across these environments? One of the first problems that we run into in RL is that it can learn really well one particular environment, but we change one thing about it and we learn it's overfit. Like it just hates that change. It does really, really well. And you change like the color and it's like, oh, that shouldn't matter. And it matters entirely, it fits. But if you give it lots of different environments, it can do what we call curriculum learning. Like we see examples of that in literature. If they play one Atari game like Pong here, they do really, really well with Pong, but they can't deal with the bricks being different colors. But if you say the same agent must learn all the games, it has to learn a very different kind of rule, a rule that can generalize. It takes a lot longer to train, but it is big computers for us, that's okay. And it learns kind of a general rule. And then you can give it a novel game, a game it's never seen. And it can do pretty well. It's not as good as if you just like overfit to that one game, but it's pretty good. And it's a completely new environment. So this is where we'd kind of like to go next is to be able to not just use these to kind of solve one environment where like, I know the rules, I know the model. I just put it in the simulation, but to learn across different models. If you can go far enough with this, then we are in a sense, allowing the agent to do what we call sort of model-free learning. 
right? It's not trying to make predictions under the hood at all. After all, it's trying to learn a decision space. Given these observations, choose among these actions. And our real world is often like that. Ecology, we live in this giant space of potential, the state space, right? The, the, the systems we deal with are immensely complicated, but the actions available to us are often much more limited. And also the observations we get of those systems are much more limited than the underlying state space. So this is exploiting that, right? Like if you're just doing that small map from a number of possible observations, number of possible actions, this is easier for the algorithm to learn than to learn to predict the actual underlying state, which I think will often just be impossible. Limited data and such rich nonlinear behavior that it can do, it's often going to be beyond reach. So I encourage one of the advantages of this approach is you also don't have to have like deep mathematical background to kind of jump in and play in this space. It scales kind of very nicely. You don't need to know all of the analytic theory or all of the theory of stochastic dynamic programming, which can be quite annoying. You just kind of write a simulation. You write down your process, you write it as kind of a just a forward process in time, you state what your utility is, and you can have lots of variations of it. And you say, good, this is my, my challenge. Computer, can you do this? It's great fun as a pedagogy tool. You can also ask your students here, this is just like a computer game. How good are you? Can you beat the RL algorithm? Can you beat your neighbor? Sometimes they can do much better. The algorithms can sometimes be quite terrible. We'll see this in a moment. So try them out uh, and see how well you can do. How well does it work? RL can go very well. I've made some examples where it seems to be working, but it can also go very badly, right? It's a heuristic algorithm and it can get really stuck. Sometimes it gets stuck in a local minimum. So this is a classic robotic example of learning to walk and this thing gets its reward by moving to the left and it's learned how to move to the left. And it's very hard to unlearn this behavior because it gets points and it's inefficient and slow, but it gets worse than that, right? So sometimes there are different ways to get rewards so this is a racing game that this algorithm is playing and it learns to get rewards in an unusual way. You're going the wrong way around the race. You're supposed to follow the arrows and you're not supposed to crash into things, but it's in fact gonna beat all the human players because it happens to get a little bit of a reward for picking up these little green fuel blobs and it's decided that it just gets stuck in this loop. It can pick up those green fuel blobs by crashing into everything and going the wrong way and not doing the task we want at all. Like, this is not the future we want, right? So how, how, do, how do we avoid this? Are people trying to do this in the real world? There are little examples now that we see AI in particular and some examples of RRL being deployed already. And there's this weird phenomenon going on, by the way, in which anytime I seem to look at examples coming from my computer science colleagues or from the industry in AI in conservation space, somehow it always comes down to, where do we send the men with guns? So this is two examples that is some beautiful work from our colleagues at Harvard. But like, hey, it's about conservation and protected areas and where to send the rangers to maximize their efficiency to kind of stop illegal poaching. Uh, this is a very cute example of the RL is not very important here, it just helps the robot drive. Uh, this is just getting rid of the invasive starfish. Uh, so this is a killer robot that already is uh, loose in the Australian seas. I think that one's actually fine and not just, but militarization of decisions again, right? That like we have Global Fishing Watch, we have Sky Truth and Sky Light and Forest Watch. We have all of these things that are like, let's put a surveillance technology on and reduce the conservation problem to stopping illegal action. Now I'm sure that's a very important part of it, but I'm just not sure that the only thing we need to do for conservation is to just send the guns in the right place to stop all of the problems. So I think we need to think kind of bigger about the way these things can be used but this also raises very interesting and often tough questions about what does it really mean? What does it really look like when we say algorithms are taking control of decisions, algorithms that can sometimes give us kind of weird solutions or be only used by those who have the biggest computers in the world. In fact, this isn't a new problem. As I started talking about this, I learned from some of my colleagues that like we've had this problem in ecology for a long time in political ecology. We, you know, we can write down equations and say, these are the best places for protected areas or marine protected areas. But if we employ those policies and geographies of conflict without understanding the social context, well, it can be a great tool for a dictator to be like, oh, these are the people I'm fighting against. They're in a protected area and I have the right to pick them, to bring in force. So things are militarized even before we bring in algorithms. So understanding that context is important and knowing how that plays out, 
right? And as we look at the biases in our data and the way those biases are growing and who has control of that data, who has access to the data, who has the infrastructure to run these algorithms, are we at a transition point between the points where this data can be analyzed by academics and be in a public sphere? Already, all of those nature and science covers I showed, there's no single academic unit represented there. Every one of those is an industry group, an industry paper. That research is now being led out of industry. What does it mean if conservation research is also owned by industry? Uh, where does it go? Working with colleagues in social science, it's great to be in a department called environmental science policy and management because we have social scientists that force us to wrestle with those and make us think not in the language of approaching these problems from a purely technocratic stance, but from a political stance, from a social science stance, from a policy stance. I learned the language of loops, the theories of power, that there are different ways to influence a decision. We often think only about the first of Luke's myths of power, decision-making power, like you should be the decision-maker. One of my colleagues talks about this kind of the mythical decision-maker, this person who sits in a room and looks at the data that we're going to give them, looks at our models, and makes decisions. Like, I've yet to meet this person. Real decisions are made by complex social groups with different interacting needs, bringing that to the table, and it kind of emerge as a social process. There's rarely a single technocrat sitting on top of the globe saying, this is what we're going to do. And if we want to influence those decisions, we need to understand how they are made, how they are made. One of the core lessons I've learned from this process, it's often not about building this technology in a way in which we can kind of stand in our tower and be like, we have run the data, we have looked at the models, this is the answer, but it's about handing this tool to others. A term I was introduced to is that of countermapping, of that Communities uh, that have been oppressed have, have often resented maps as a way that has been used sort of against them, to segregate them, to isolate them. But they can also use maps within their own communities to kind of reclaim territory, to redefine where boundaries are, to rewrite the political structures within their own societies. So this isn't just about us building tools that we alone can use or say answers, but providing tools to other people, providing these abilities to engage in these discussions. So these are the other kind of layers of power, to be able to set the agenda, to be able to say, what are the things that are under discussion? Uh, and what we call world-making power. So be like, what are the questions that we can ask? GBIF is one example of this and sort of focusing that these are the data we have and this is represented in these countries. We see this happening in other sectors, like our satellite data, right? Which was once dominated by public government products but as now our industry, space industry is privatized and we have CubeSats going around that give us much, much better data. But they have an economic model behind them where they want to observe certain areas of economic interest more and other areas less. And so it's not necessarily an intentional bias, but certain areas we just have less information, less precise information. And it's not random either, like which areas are left out of our data. So as we try to walk into a world of data-driven decision-making, I think we have to wrestle with those questions that we can pretend the data are objective facts. The algorithms are transparent, unbiased decision makers. But the closer we look at them, none of them are. So understanding the ways in which these things play out, uh, that's why Hobbes' cover of the Leviathan is here, and I'm trying to learn a little bit more about these things. And I'll kind of close there and see if there are any questions. Yes, please. Very interesting. Um, I was wondering about, well, because you were talking about like the practicalities of all this, um, and now there's not like a big room with uh, the, the main decision maker in it usually, I was wondering about the problems with having highly variable guidelines on harvesting, right? Because I was thinking about how like, maybe if you have a set, a set rule that you follow, you can just kind of do that forever and then check in every five years and you have to employ way fewer people to make those models. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So there's a technocratic answer to that, right? Which is like, if doing something like adjusting the harvest each year is impractical or has a cost, like the technocratic answer is like, well, that should have been reflected in the equations, right? Like you don't want to impose that on the solution. You just say, there's a cost to doing that. That's what the economists want us. How much does it cost to adjust that? Well, Maybe you say it's a constraint, like there's just no way we are allowed to change that, find the best value. 
So the algorithm is perfectly happy to search for that in the constraint. It's just saying your action spaces choose the best fixed value. And I think often you're right. We're in those situations where like we don't have a huge space of action. What we don't want to fall into though, and I think we can sometimes do, is we just kind of let math create our constraints for us, right? We say we're not doing it not because the fisherman says it's unpractical, but the mathematician says it's unpractical, right? That's, we don't need that to be the reason. So one thing that I was thinking about during your talk, and I think this was a question, although it might turn out just to be a thought that you can comment on, is that the challenge in training an algorithm to make any ecological decision is that we don't know what outcome we want on a measurable time scale. Do you know what I mean? Like often the outcome we want is something that we'll know 10 years after we implement the policy. And to do that, with learning and reinforcement, yeah. you know, uh, is just, one can imagine in sort of a science fiction novel writing scenario where, you know, foundation, what was that 3000 years or something, but um, you know, where the algorithm keeps getting better. But I'm wondering if you've thought about other than where to send the people with the guns, what kinds of ecological problems and maybe you get something in fisheries, but I actually don't think Fisheries yeah. is a good example because the number of fish we see next year isn't really telling us the thing we want to know. Um, so, so are there examples where? Absolutely. So I think this is a delayed rewards question, right? Is what the, the RL will say. S saying sometimes we're not, we don't kind of actually get the reward until way at the end. And of course that makes the algorithms harder to learn. If you think about that race course one, it's an example of this, right? That they were having trouble training the algorithm and they said, like, in order to make it just not like run out of fuel, they said, give it a couple of bonus points for picking the fuel. We teach kids to play chess, we tell them this, right? Like, there's one game in chess to win, right? You just need to capture the king, it happens at the end. But we give people rules of thumb and we say, a rook is worth more than a pawn. It's not, they're, they're worth nothing. The only thing is to win. But it's a good rule of thumb that kind of helps you make decisions because it makes it a shorter term reward problem. But many, if I understand you correctly, some ecology things and probably many of our decisions or really like the chess game, the only thing that matters is to win at the end. It's been a problem, but it's been a problem that CS has recognized well as well, these kind of really delayed rewards. And there are kind of a wealth of, just, it's both still open, but we are actually not as bad as we used to be at solving problems where we get that really delayed feedback. It can even occur in the observation space. You're just acting and acting, and you don't even know if it's going up or down in the right way. The RL framework is perfectly happy to try to chip away at this. They make it harder, but they don't make it impossible. So I think we can learn. Now, the question is how often do, do, do conservation problems look like that at all? I mean, some of our problems are not even iterative in that way. We get one action, or we choose to think of them that way. We're doing California 30 by 30. We're gonna put conservation areas one time forever in one place and call it done, right? Or at least for the next several decades, right? We don't need RL for that, but we have totally different challenges. So where do we put those areas? Where is the kind of best way to think about it? And we have kind of different problems that come with that. But yeah, I think there's something to be done for those. They're all kind of interesting problems, but they're not by definition sort of incompatible with thinking of it this framework. Yeah, Peter. This may not even make sense, but I'm wondering, Great. so instead of always projecting into the future, how well does this approach perform if what you're really trying to do is sort of reconstruct the past? Mm -hmm. And sort of, un, if you will, develop rules of the game from the, from from that process. Yeah, it's one of the things that people have tried, and I it gets me worried almost sometimes to say this is not a way to decide policy, but this is a way to understand evolution or behavior, right? And they don't do one player RL where you're like you're trying to optimize. They say there are millions of different individuals running around a landscape, and they all are using RL to learn or to evolve. There's gazelle and lions co-evolving with RL, telling them where to, when to forage, what time to do that. It makes me nervous because RL is designed to find good solutions. It wasn't designed to be a model of evolution. It's being done in economics too. The economists are now doing this. There was a team out of Salesforce saying, let's pretend we have agents trying to avoid tax policy or whatever. And another agents are using RL trying to pick the tax policy. And they argue that not only do you get better results out of the RL, but you learn like, that the current free market 
or the Sayez formula came out of Berkeley complaining the free market is broken. Like you can beat both of these in terms of a series of metrics, both mm -hmm. on equity as well as total productivity with what they're what they're calling their AI economy to do. I think that's interesting, but kind of weird to me to be like, RL, it's not an optimization tool now, it's a model of human behavior, avoiding taxes. It's a model of an evolving agent, but this multiplayer RL is a super big topic right now and you'd be interested in that. Yeah. We spent a lot of time talking about that like simple models are maybe not so useful. I'm curious. You see a use for theory still. So. Yeah, I think simple models are great, right? I mean, one of the best things about simple models is the great way to break things, right? Because, I mean, I think as we learned in theoretical ecology, like simple models can create complex behavior, and that can be really hard to deal with, right? And so I think that's in a way I've kind of gotten here, like through simple models, right? The challenge is that I can have too many different simple models that are consistent with the observations I'm able to make. And I don't fundamentally have a way to resolve that. It would be, if it, from a pure science way, I think simple models are kind of the only way to go because the complex models are even worse. They, they, they fit even worse, you know. This is about, the underlying simulations here are still process-based. They're still mechanistic. They're still driven by the same simple models. There's another school of AI, right, that isn't doing this at all. It's saying, give me the data. I won't know anything about process-based models and I'll make a super complicated model that forecasts the future and I'll drive simulations for that. I see no particular use for that, right? My fisheries models or that green crowd, they're all driven by models you would recognize. You'd be like, that's an integral fish model, right? They're, they have all the bells and whistles that we can't put in an analytic decision framework, but they're still simple models. So I'm really glad you asked that. And I don't want people to say like, the things we're learning are not good. I think the worst stuff is like, oh, we'll take all AI empirical models and throw all of that out. And we'll like, uh, then we're just making shit up, right? Like if, if we can have managers, our AI agents make good decisions for the, our, our simple models, which already do really complex behavior, I think that's already beyond where we're at. And I think that's me. Yes, Marissa. Building on your answer to Peter about how, for me, you think behavior raises a lot of ethical issues. At the same time, you would take a look at your fishery stuff and say, overfishing is not an issue of getting the harvest control right. It's an issue of incentives, of common pool resource incentives. And the fix is not more precise fishery management. The fix is fixing those incentives with catch shares, with individual transferable quotas, the fix, common pool resource incentives, right? And to consider that fix, you need to consider the human behavior. Absolutely. And humans as a couple, human natural part of the system. So how do we... Well they're, well, they're they're both right, right? Like Jim is is making the argument in the first place that it kind of says even if we had the technocratic solution, like let's pretend the real world is that one-dimensional model for which we know the optimal solution. People still don't do it when we screw up the social structure, and I couldn't agree more with them, right? And that's where I'm going back, and that that's kind of the end of this, saying we need to know the social context in which these are employed. And I think sometimes economists are very good at helping us think about how do we design incentives the right way and don't lead people in the wrong directions. Sometimes our economists can still miss some social contexts by saying that like this works well in a democratic government with a market economy, but doesn't transfer into a different social context. And we have experts in other fields that understand those systems well and can help us get, learn those. So that's there, but it's the next step. But I would critique Jim a little bit that like, I think we like to pretend that we know the right answers only because we don't have the counterfactual. But maybe that's true in the most part that like, despite ecology looking really complex, like MSY did do pretty well, most of the time pretty good. Yeah, I don't know, but it's hard to really prove that we couldn't possibly doing better. We never have this counterfactual. But so, I wonder oh, yeah. more like, is, does looking at it with bringing in human behavior and having a couple of human natural systems help expand the solution set that you can look at. Yes, absolutely. And it's and, and, and luckily you have like a relatively like easy way to do that, right? You can just like add that behavior in. Like if you have equations, which when you're doing like the transferable quotas, like the economists have equations and they say, this is the behavior of the, of the human agents. That's great. That works really naturally in this without a lot of effort. You can do the AI economist version of it where you have multiple agents. That's a little different, right? But it still works. Right. So it lets you kind of poke at those things. Yeah, Sasha. So this was a really fun and provocative talk, a lot to think about. 
One thing I was wondering is to what extent is RL, RL just sort of like a temporary solution that's just waiting for computational power to catch up? Because stochastic, I mean, one of the issues with something like stochastic dynamic programming or other optimization methods is the state space on which you're working is so large, right? Like if you were doing like your harvesting model for three species, you know, you have to discretize like voxels of densities right, and then, exactly, and then yeah. put it like that discretized format into like a this like stochastic dynamic dynamic programming sort of framework. And that's like a lot, I can imagine that would be a ton of computational effort that yeah. we can't even handle at this point. I don't know for sure or not, but is that is that really, is that a reasonable way of looking at things? Or is it really that uh, no computation is never gonna catch up um, and, or that just stochastic dynamic programming or whatever other optimization tool is being used is somehow not able to capture things that RL is able to capture? It's a great question. I and mean, it's something our computer scientists like, like have asked a lot, right? And like, at least now their current thinking is that it looks like again and again, heuristic algorithms have way, way outpaced and outperformed exact solutions. Right. And so their thinking is still like, it won't, it won't catch up. The heuristic right. stuff that the neural nets can do seems to have just won the day. At the but moment. are they like in the t places you can compare, yeah. Are the heuristics just roughly as good as the optimization approach and never better? Or are they actually sometimes better or typically better? Well, I mean, the the, the, the exact solutions are unbeatable, right? right. That's, right. That's, that's so you never, no, you never beat the exact solutions, right. but you can get like- You can get there faster, close. less computation. Okay, so, so places where we do exact solutions are actually not faster, right? Like if you have an exact solution, like it's still faster or, or even the approximate. The only cases where it matters is you put like lots of complexity and you have kind of the choice you're forced to make is use a solution that came from the scaled down simplified model that I could solve and just kind of hope that the exact solution to the approximation of the model is better than the approximate solution to the like actual full model. So which do you approximate? Yeah. So that makes sense. And one other quick yeah. like comment maybe this is I feel a little bit like how being and the defense of beanbag genetics, yeah. which in this case, beanbag genetics mathematicians, um, <laughs> is, uh, you know, like you were advocating at one point, like, oh, we can have this framework, we don't have to know any mathematics, you just program in the rules, da 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 da. And I would argue that that's maybe not a fair representation of what one's doing, that all those agent based objects that people seem to view as not mathematical models are actually more often than not. A, a type of let's say continuous time or discrete time process, yeah, yeah. maybe non-stationary. So they that that object does fit in a broader mathematical framework. And if you want to communicate accurately among scientists about what your model is, you need to have a common language of describing how you're encoding different processes and different fun, you know, different responses. Yeah. To inputs, right? And I don't see a way to do that without using a little bit of something that one might call math. No, no, I didn't see the point entirely, right? Like under the hood, you're right. These are all mathematics and the familiar mathematics. Yeah. And even more than that, the one thing I think is easier though, is this, you can think of this as just new symbol symbology, like math often improves by better notation. Yeah. And maybe that's a better analogy. This is just another kind of way to express notation yeah, sure. that we can kind of collaborate. Yeah. Like you can now build the model, but you don't have to know how to solve the equation. That's right, for sure. I, I think, think that's all yeah, doing, yeah. right? And I shouldn't, yeah, I agree entirely. Yeah. Cool. I should stop. Thank Carl so much. <laughs>